Hang on. So, okay. It just, it, it went a bit mad, I think, for a bit. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, 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 it did that the last time. Yeah, so it, it needed also a needed a nap. I've not been looking after my screen. That's very true. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Sue. Um, yes, so I just want to expand a little bit on what we watched uh, from those three um, uh, amazing women. And um, I'm going to just very quickly go through a little presentation that I have um, uh, done with some students and also with my colleagues last Friday and it's just exploring unconscious bias and what it actually means and also using it as a way to reflect and improve outcomes of black and brown women and birthing people so I'll be asking a few questions in between the presentation mm. so if you could type the answers in the chat box that'd be really good um, so I'll just go on to the next slide so I like to give people a little bit about me before I do these presentations. So I studied at the University of Hertfordshire and I qualified in 2003. And my passion is for normalizing birth and advocacy. So advocacy for women. Uh, this picture here is of my great grandmother who, this picture has always been in our house and my dad Never really. I mean, he spoke about his grandma a lot because he was brought up by his grandmother. His mother died very young. Um, but it wasn't until I started my midwifery training that he sent me a letter halfway through with this picture um, to tell me that actually she was a traditional birth attendant. So uh, he said he just thought it was just amazing that I had, you know, not unknowingly gone into the same profession that his uh, grandma um, uh, was in. And at the time she used to get paid in goats and chickens. There you go. So, <laughs> so um, when I ran this uh, session, it was a sort of group discussion. But uh, if you could, if you want to, maybe just type a little bit about what you understand by unconscious bias and whether you can identify the different types of bias. So I'll give people like a minute or two to do that or a few seconds actually to do that. Um, if you could tell me anything you know about unconscious bias and if you know if there are any different types of bias basically. So. Right, so, so as you're typing, I will go on to the next slide, which does discuss it, and we'll see if we match up. So what is unconscious bias? So it's defined as the social stereotyping of certain groups of people that individuals form outside their own conscious awareness. So basically, we're saying we're not aware that we form these biases. And the Oxford Dictionary um, definition is an unfair belief about a group of people that affects your behavior and decisions. So moving on to the types of bias that we might have. We've got color or culture bias. So that's kind of self-explanatory. So you look at someone's color and because of the color of their skin, you have an already formed bias about how they might be. And also maybe an assumed culture as well. You think because they come from X, Y, Z or because they look like X, Y, Z, their culture is going to be like this. And then you make judgments based on that. Have gender bias. So again, self-explanatory uh, uh, one of the major types of gender bias is inequality for women against men. So women doing the same job, but getting paid uh, a, a lot less than men do. Ageism. So again, discriminated against people because they're either too young or too old for a certain role. We have name bias. So you hear somebody's name and you automatically connect them with something either negative or positive. Um, one of the examples of this that I thought was really quite clear was uh, just after 9-11, I went to the States and um, you get to the gate and they say they're doing random checks on people and almost everybody they called had a name like Mohammed or something that sounded like it wasn't uh, American or, you know, sounded like it could be the name of somebody who might be uh, a Muslim. And they would say at the beginning that they were not uh, discriminating, which clearly wasn't true. And confirmation bias is when you have a preconceived idea about a certain person or certain culture, and then you meet them and they kind of tie in with what you think about that culture. And then it kind of confirms your bias. And you think, oh, I was right because I've read that this is what these kind of people do. And then maybe it could just be one 
characteristics out of the many that you've thought, but you will then use that to confirm your bias and almost justify treating that person unfairly. So what are the effects of unconscious bias on midwifery care? How do you think unconscious bias can affect the way we treat our women? So it can almost be a bit of a vicious cycle. So black and brown women and birthing people are not treated with equity, leading to unacceptable levels of morbidity and mortality. They then um, become marginalized communities that become mistrusting of maternity services and they might be reluctant to engage because their initial experience has been negative. We then label them as difficult and unwilling to engage and the cycle of substandard care continues. So we, we put the blame on them. Oh, but they don't attend. They don't do this and they don't do that. But we forget about the fact that it's our bias that has actually made their care substandard. So a very quick look at the racist roots of obstetrics and midwifery. This is a very popular image. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what's going on here, but this is the image of uh, Dr. Mariam Jane Sims. He sort of perfected his art by practicing on enslaved women, and he used them to try and perfect his craft on treating obstetric fistulas. Um, of the women that he worked on, they went through numerous um, operations, they nearly died. Um, he had medical students coming in to witness what he was doing. And when he did try it on white women, not one white woman could withstand one of his operations. So um, if any of you can remember, we do actually have an instrument named after him. It's the Sims uh, Speculum. And a while ago, there were lots of people who were um, asking for the name of this speculum to be changed because of the legacy that he left behind. He also did, ex he also experimented on enslaved babies. Um, he believed that neonatal tetanus was caused by a misalignment of the skull. So he tried to maneuver the skull with a, a very uh, crude instrument. I think it's, uh, it was a shoemaker's I, can't, I think it's called an owl, I can't remember, but um, he had a 100% mortality rate with this procedure, which meant that all the babies he experimented on died, not one of them survived this. Um, now, I bring this up because I was doing a little bit of research around um, Dr. Sims, and I was looking at recent articles that have spoken about his work. And to my dismay, I will actually say I wasn't particularly shocked, but I read an article as recent as 2018 where the writer was claiming that people who were protesting about this man um, were being hysterical because ironically, the highest number of um, sufferers of obstetric fistulas were, were African women. And it was almost as if he was trying to justify what he had done. So we're not denying that he didn't do, he didn't sort of create an operation that solved this problem, but we have to acknowledge the way in which he went out, went about it. And another article that I read that I thought was, I mean, sometimes I look at these articles and I wonder how do they actually get published? Um, but another one of them speaks about his diary. So he, he kept journals. Um, obviously, he wrote about the women that he operated on. And he almost implies that the women gave consent. <sighs> For me personally, I think if you are talking about enslaved and consent in the same sentence, then there's something wrong with your brain. Uh, and, and I think what worries me the most is that there are people who are talking about this, you know, and we're not talking about talking about it in the 1950s, we're talking about as recently as 2018, and actually the last article I read was 2020, who feel that what he did was not a big deal. And when you think that some of these people are healthcare professionals who are looking after black and brown women, what kind of bias have they got in their minds when they go in to look after these women? I think for me personally, that is an extremely scary thought. So what do we think about how history has shaped our practice today? So I'm gonna sort of whiz through the answers, but if you want to add anything to it, you can do, and I'm sure Sue will pick them up when we get to the discussion and questions bit. So ex examples of unconscious bias in practice. 
Um, so these um, examples are things that have happened sometimes to me. I was speaking to a friend of mine who um, is a doctor. And so some of the examples are things that he has also witnessed in practice. So recognition of skin conditions in darker skin tones. So um, Alicia picked up on that as well when she was talking about the blue gray spots that were known as Mongolian um, uh, uh, blue spots. Um, and I actually, I, I can give you a personal example on this. Years ago, when my daughter was really uh, young, we went to Italy and um, she had what to me was obviously chicken pox. Um, the night that we landed, she um, felt a bit warm. And then the next morning she had spots on her. So we took her to the pharmacy and they were very lovely. Um, but the first pharmacist said, I don't think this is chicken box, this is insect bites. So I was like, okay. So she didn't want to give us the lotion because she thought it, you, you wouldn't need this for insect bites. So I thought, fair enough, but I don't think these are insect bites. We went to the second chemist and she said the same thing, but she wasn't sure. So she decided, well, I'll give you the, the lotion, but I'm not really sure that it's chicken pox, but keep an eye on her. So I didn't really think anything of it. I thought it was a bit strange that I had thought this is definitely chicken pox and they didn't seem to be agreeing with me. When we got home, my sister-in-law said to me, they probably haven't seen it on brown skin. And to be honest with you, I've only thought about that situation probably in the last few months that, wow, you know, there's this is chicken pox, which usually is a fairly you know straightforward illness in children but what if it had been something more serious and because of their time in the time they took to diagnose it it could have gone so horribly wrong so to think that even chicken pox which you think is quite a common ailment in children that you would have some people who would not be able to recognize that in a child with darker skin tone um, assuming that black and brown patients do not require analgesia so a lot of the um a lot of the blogs and stories that I read about black and brown women, especially in birthing people, talking about their experience is being denied analgesia. And you might not think this is a big deal, but I have read articles where um, there have been medical students that have been um, uh, have, have been spoken to who truly believe that black and brown women or black and brown patients have thicker skin and therefore do not feel pain as much and they will withhold analgesia based on this. My doctor friend also said when he was in hospital he asked for pain relief following um, having his tonsils removed and he was actually told he couldn't have it because they didn't want him to become addicted and he was told that to his face. It then turned out that he actually had PRN medication on his drug chart. So again coming from health professionals um, I think that's actually quite quite sad to hear but also kind of scary that we would deliberately withhold analgesia from one group of people based on on nothing really. So negative language is used to describe a condition for black patients while using more positive language for white patients. So again, um, you hear the term personality disorder with a lot more black patients than you do with white patients. And you hear the term bipolar used more with white patients. Labeling certain patients as having poor English skills rather than acknowledging their accent. So again, not taking the time to understand somebody just because they don't speak like you, when actually they have very good communication skills, but you've already looked at them and judged them the minute they come through the door and thought actually they have poor English. Using family members as translators, having decided that the patient does not need an official translator. So I've witnessed this in practice before. Uh, assumption of rec recreational drug use with certain ethnicities and assumption of FGM practice within certain communities. So again, one of my colleagues brought up the fact that actually FGM is not just practiced within black and brown communities. There are actually white women who suffer this as well, but sometimes we make an assumption that it's only with a certain community or certain group of people, normally black or brown, who come from certain areas of the world that would have FGM. So the implications for this is delay in diagnosis can lead to rapid deterioration. If you don't know what's wrong with someone based on the fact that you have not had the education about different skin tones, and that could lead to a delay in actually figuring out what's wrong and they could get sicker. Withholding analgesia can cause both physical and emotional pain. A lack of appropriate interpreter can lead to not understanding vital information and vice versa. Negative descriptions of patients or conditions or assumed behavior can lead to unfair treatment from staff. 
what can we do about this? So the first thing is that we need to acknowledge there's a problem. And at the moment, so many of us are not acknowledging that there's a problem. So I'm going to ask another question, which you can type into the chat box. Since the Embrace report came out and since George Floyd died and since there has been a lot more discussion around inequalities in maternal health, I would like you to share with us if anything has actually changed where you work. So are you receiving any unconscious bias training? Are you receiving cultural sensitivity training? Are you yourself doing anything about it if nothing is being done? If you're a student, has there be, been a change in your curriculum or the things that you're learning about? Um, so we are all human and we have biases. So I have a bias, I have several biases and I'm aware that I have these biases. So it's not just white people have biases, brown, black and brown people have biases too. We need to be able to say that we have that. And if we, can't, if we can't accept that, if we keep going on with the mantra that we treat everybody with equality and you don't see color, I mean, please try to stop saying you don't see color. If you don't see color, there's an issue there. You should be seeing color and you should be acknowledging that actually because somebody is a different color, they might be treated differently. And that is why we need to acknowledge our bias. And the other thing as well is, as I think Sue kind of touched on that briefly is, are biases unconscious? Some of them might be, but it's almost a lazy way of saying, oh, well, you know, we didn't know about it, it's unconscious, oh, well. A lot of it actually is not unconscious. It is something that you know you are doing, but you do not want to change that behavior. Awareness, so recognizing the bias when we look after patients and making a conscious effort to put it aside. So no matter what you think of that culture or color, put it aside and start afresh and be led by that person. Education, decolonizing the curriculum. So if we are not teaching our medical students or our student midwives or student nurses what to look out for, how are they supposed to learn on the job when all of us who have gone through that education learnt the same whitewash curriculum? So we need to start changing the way we educate people. Educate yourselves as well. So um, I was listening to the little bit of Alicia's um, uh, um, talk and I, I heard her say, educate yourselves. So I have deliberately not shared with you um, the the articles that I read because I think part of having an interest in actually pushing for change is to go and educate yourselves there is so much out there when you go on social media when you go there's so many articles that you can access online and it shouldn't be up to us always telling you what you need to do to access the educate to access the um, information it is out there for you to look at and part of you being willing to change is going to seek out that information for yourself um, so the other thing I wanted to say is if you think nothing has changed at your unit, perhaps you'd like to tell us why you think that's a problem. Is it because you yourself are being quiet? So again, if you listen to what Mars said, it's not enough to be, um, it's not enough not to be racist. You have to be, you know, you have to do more than just saying, well, I'm not a racist. You have to push for change. You have to support us. You have to be our allies if you want things to change. Otherwise, they will stay exactly the same as they are. So a quick quiz. Um, I'm just looking at the time because I'm hoping that we can take a few questions after this. Um, one of the things that I think about really examining your bias is that it's it almost be, it shouldn't just be applied to maternal health it should be a way of life almost and so I've got a little quiz here um, that I like to play and it's about being aware of other people of um, color who are black or brown who you may or may not have heard of in the media or seen pictures of them and just trying to test your your knowledge of other cultures other than you know people who are white and what um and what these people stand for. So you can have a quick look at this, um, at, the, at these pictures and see how many of them that you have spotted. Um, so I'm going to tell you who's who. So first lady is uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She is a Nigerian author and um, she is, uh, she's written a uh, loads of books. Um, you might have heard of Half of a Yellow Sun, which is a book that talks about the Nigerian civil war in the 60s. And actually, for me, that was quite a good learning curve, because I, even as a Nigerian, I knew about this, but I didn't really know the ins and outs of it. So it's quite, a, it's quite an interesting book to read. 
Um, the second lady is Elizabeth Nekanyo. I think she has actually been uh, on the midwifery hour at some of the conferences, but she is um, a nurse who ha um, helped to set up the Centre for Sickle Cell Anemia in North London. At the top, we've got Mary Seacole. So she was a nurse who wanted to go and help out with the Crimean War. She was denied this. So she set up a hotel herself and looked after sick people. And underneath this couple here are the Lovins. This is Richard and Mildred Lovin. Their marriage was termed uh, illegal. So um, at the time they were sentenced to a year in prison and they had to leave the state of Virginia. Um, they then decided that actually they were not going to take this lying down. And in 1967, they had their, um, they had their sentence overturned. And I'm not really sure why he's down there, but I think at the time I was looking for an image of Lenny Henry and I don't know why he came up, but I quite like him as an actor. This is Donald Glover and he's also a rapper. So some people might know him as Childish Gambino. So I just put him there because I like the picture. So again, it's just being aware of what do you know about actually influential black and brown people and why, why do you not know about this? Is it because what you are accessing, our education, our media, everything that we access is so whitewashed that we actually don't get to hear about the achievements of other people. So I have a very quick video. Um, I think I can probably show this. It's literally, um, I'm not gonna show the whole thing. I just want you to listen to the first couple of minutes of the conversation Welcome and understand um, how Your bias can uh, affect news. the way we speak to Is other people. And do people read your books in Nigeria? They do, shockingly. <laughs> they do. Are there bookshops in Nigeria? Je vois, je vois, je vois. You know, I think, <laughs> I think it's, I think it reflects very poorly on French people that you have to ask me that question. I really do. Because, I mean, Okay, so I'm just going to stop that there because I just wanted you to hear the question. So finally, very quickly, what are you going to do about it? So be proactive and call it out. I mean, if you see inequalities or you can see where people are not being treated equally and that includes your colleagues, do not be silent about it. Take responsibility and enlighten yourselves. There are so many things available now. Conferences, social media, reading resources. Use your powers for good, be an ally, and push for change in your place of work, cultural awareness training. And um, I'm just going to go to the last slide of my little doggy with the ears to say I'm all ears if um, anybody has any questions. Um, and I will stop sharing now. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.